welcome to Sunday night at Lancaster Baptist. Let's stand together and let's sing as the choir joins us. There is power in the blood. Lift up your voice as we sing tonight. All together on that first now, let's lift up our voice. Ready? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. around you tonight for the evening service, please. together now our second hymn that we would like to sing tonight is there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins there is a fountain filled with blood let's sing that there is a fountain
singing tonight. Let's turn our attention to the baptistry where we have some for baptism tonight. In Acts chapter number 2 verse 41, the Bible says that they that gladly received the word were baptized and the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls and tonight we rejoice with this one who has accepted Christ. Now she's taking that first step of obedience to identify with the Lord's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Marlene, Marlene, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. On that public profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear the likeness of his death. Raise the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. You may be seated. Thank the Lord for this dear one and others that were baptized this morning. And we want to recognize, Brother Williams, if you'll help me, some folks that have finished their discipleship. And uh, I'm glad to see this. Uh, Brother and Mrs. Uh, Galan uh, have finished theirs. Where are you? Uh, the Galans, raise your hands right back here. And uh, not brand new Christians, but new to our church and wanted to go through Continue. And let's congratulate them for completing uh, this discipleship program and members of the His Design class. And I want to commend uh, the His Design class. We had lunch today with Brother and Mrs. Choi, and I and, uh, just went down the road and asked about different families. And, and uh, so many of you families are being so faithful and encouraging this uh, new teacher in your class. He and his wife doing a great job. And so congratulations on that. Thank you for being uh, faithful to look to Christ and His mission and to support uh, all that's taking place in your Adult Bible Connection Group. And then also we have Anissa Sanchez, and Anissa is from the uh, Thrive class. Anissa, are you in here tonight? Raise your hand if you are, right back on the back left there. And let's congratulate her for completing her discipleship as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I wanted to take just a minute uh, before I pray for the offering and just uh, give a word of thanks. And uh, sometimes that's a hard thing for me to do in the sense that there's so many to thank and I'm always afraid of missing somebody. So, uh, But I want to give thanks to everybody that helped with the youth conference. And uh, it's, it's one of those areas where uh, just so many helped. I want to thank all the ushers that came in Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And uh, some of you guys said, that was my first youth conference. That was great. And I really appreciated uh, the, the watch care that you provided. You did a great job. We had bus drivers that helped uh, with the youth conference as well. And so I want to just say, if you were an usher, a bus driver, or one of the church members that helped, would you just stand up in the auditorium? I'm not sure what all the categories, might have been some food service, I don't know what else. Some of you ushers in the back, wave your hands. Would you join me in thanking all of these who helped with Youth Conference this year? Wonderful. I got to tell you that uh, when we have an event like this, I'm always, in the right sense of the word, very proud of our church family for the way that you serve others. And I really appreciated the great, great effort. And I do want to thank our staff as well. It was just amazing for me. Uh, I don't know how to really put into words the effort, the, the thousands and thousands of hours that went into the Spiritual Leadership Asia Conference. And it's uh, uh, amazing just a few weeks ago that our church family, about a hundred of us, joined lots of others in the Philippines, but uh, serving uh, as many as 10,000 people a day for a week of services there. And, and the folks just did a great job with that. And then to come back and, and to have youth conference and now Easter, and I want to particularly just uh, commend all of our uh, graphics and sound and video folks that just have been uh, going overboard. And I know of several men, I'm not going to try to mention all their names, that last week 
uh, two, three in the morning, sometimes four in the morning, videoing and filming and editing and, and planning all of these things and then uh, finishing up this week for uh, Easter and so forth. And so I just want to say the Lord knows all the names, but a job well done to the youth staff, the college staff. And I also want to mention Brother Furso keeping the uh, door knocking and keeping us going, getting ready for Easter while the youth conference was happening. Just a great team effort by the church staff this past week, and it was a blessing uh, to me just to watch it and to be a part of it uh, with each and every one of you. And uh, we had a great service on Friday morning. We had several dozen teenagers that surrendered their lives to full-time ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we had about 30 seniors that were here that had already registered for West Coast and another dozen or so that registered. And so good things all the way around. And I want to thank you again uh, for hosting all of these teens that came in uh, for the conference. Uh, there was a lot of fun uh, during the conference. And uh, I told you, some of you that watched it on live stream, I said, you're not going to understand most of that. And I, I sat in the back with a couple of other pastors uh, that were our guests in their 60s. And, and uh, we we just sat on the back wall and watched uh, as stuff flew out of the rafters and as, you know, there was all kinds of skits and uh, there were, uh, there was a basketball hoop. There was a slam dunk competition in this auditorium amongst the teenagers. Uh, they had people dropping out of the ceiling and all kinds of crazy things. So we can't reenact all of that, uh, but there were a couple of fun videos and I asked them if they would just take a minute. We'll pray for the offering in a minute. But uh, right now, let's go ahead and watch this one fun video from the youth conference that that I thought you might enjoy. Felipe has always loved to talk about outer space. In fact, in high school, he wanted to join the rocket club right away. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of expensive and they don't, know, they don't always work. Yeah, Felipe's always trying to look out for the little guy. And well, when I told him that Pluto is not a real planet, he, he took that pretty hard. I had no idea that Felipe had this space interest, but when we started filming for Youth Conference a few months back, uh, I think that really sparked something in him. Does Felipe have what it takes to be an astronaut? No. No. It wasn't long before Felipe was making plans for a rocket, and none of us thought anything of it. We just kind of let him do his thing. He doesn't have a lot of mechanical training, uh, but he figured out how to get his paws around the scissors. and. Uh, he went to town with that. He got on this rocket that he built with, of course, some of these crazy people, and they shot it off. Time passed, and we didn't really think much of it until we saw him streaking through the sky. And by that point, it's too late. Just said a prayer for him. Temperatures are sitting at 61 in Buffalo. We have a northerly wind at 7. Good sleeping weather tonight, folks. Uh, you can, what was that? Did anybody see that thing? You tell us what you think it is. Right here. Ready? Right there. Bakersfield resident Tim Harvey sent it from his ring camera. He lives in Hagen Oaks off Ming and Versace Drive. Well, I have to say I was happy for the guy. He finally uh, got in the sky. Uh, something he always dreamed of. I've been doing this for... <clears throat> 30 years so and I can't describe to you what I saw that night there was a spaceship just flying through the sky now I was real hopped up on Red Bull at the time but I know what I saw it was the night that I, I met him that I met the boy from the stars it was a quiet night it was just before the radish harvest and all of a sudden I I saw this, this crazy light. It was coming from, from the sky. It was, it was like a, a firefly, but, but bigger, and, and it didn't blink on and off. But what did the Lord do? He took my Felipe to Amish country. Those Amish people, they forgive everybody. 
and then I thought to myself, if it ain't those Russell boys at it again. I, I swore last time that it would be the last time, and so I had to I had to go finish them off. I thought they were gonna get me like Joe said they would. Mama, Joe, Joe warned me. He told me, stay away from that west side. They're gonna, they're gonna snatch you. So I, I got to the barn, and at first I saw the very edge of his foot, and it was all hairy, and I thought it is one of the Russell boys. But then I got a better look, and it turns out it was, it was him. I saw him plain as day. Was I scared? No, not really, not at all, not at all. I thought, I'm surely gonna die. I'm going to see daddy. Mama, I'm going to see daddy. <sighs> Man, I thought for sure that was it for me. And uh, I just wanted to think about my uh, 12 children back at home. Gertrude, Mildred. We didn't know if he was gonna end up staying or not, but he seemed inclined. Zebediah had just left, so we needed another farmhand. And we started to realize that here on this little square of land that, that we think of as, as paradise, that God had, had sent a blessing, had sent a gift to us in the form of this red hairy creature. Those Amish people, they don't want to get all excited about technology. And boy, oh boy, not having a microwave and not having some of those conveniences, I think that would be good for him. We had to think of something to name him, so we had to think of a good Bible name for him, and we call him Esau, because he was red and hairy all over, and frankly a little bit strange. You know, they say kids these days, they, they'll bail one whole field of hay and they'll want to take a break. But you know what, Esau, he always, he always had a mind to work, and uh, I think in large part that's, that's due to me. You know, I just don't think he'd really fit in with the Amish. Felipe is kind of a free spirit. Uh, I, I think he learned a lot from us. Uh, I sure hope so, but uh, I, I think that, that it was able to rub off a little bit on him. Uh, teach him some, some work ethic, teach him some grit. But, uh, you know, I, I think we learned a, a little bit from him too. You know, I drive past that farm. Looks like they got a new farmhand out there. A uh, bit of a hairy boy, but uh, yeah, he looks like he's uh, working hard. Them Russell boys started started talking to him about Rum Springer, putting foolish notions in his head. He. He started just getting short with us. It'd only be seven or eight acres of hay baling, and, and he would start uh, getting an attitude. Uh, I, I never saw him do it for sure, but I, I'm pretty sure I just about caught him rolling his eyes. He normally kept him so still, but just his attitude with us. He always kept talking about that, that youth conference. Uh, he, 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 he loved that thing. It was, it was the one thing that we could never uh, ref get him to forget. One day I was out in the barn and, and I saw him with the, the remnants of that little buggy he rode in on. And uh, it looked like he was trying to, to fix it up, to, to escape, to leave behind all that he'd known for the last two months of his life. I, I told him everything that you're looking for is, is right here, but he wanted, he wanted more. He wanted a youth conference. You know, I don't, I don't need two hats. I, I need my boy. I need my, my Esau to, 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 to be here, to be with us. Every place that Felipe has ever gone, they wanted him to stay. And sometimes he wants to stay too. But youth conference, this is where he belongs. I've been driving for a long time. 
and I've never really driven over too many hills. It, it's flat. I've never driven like this. Always like this. And I tell you what, the government, they're hiding some stuff. I didn't remember that part, but <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thank you again, youth staff and all of you that helped with a great youth conference. And if you didn't get the meaning of the video, that's okay. All right. Um, you'll get it next year or maybe never get it, but uh, it was a great conference. And thank you again. Many of you simply prayed. And I know that really meant a lot in the altar calls. I noticed in every single service, whether it was myself, Brother Shetler, Brother Getch, uh, Brother Miller, uh, Brother Larry, whoever was preaching, there was an attentiveness that could be attributed to the prayers of God's people. So thank you for that. Well, let's stand together and take our Bibles tonight and turn to 3 John. And uh, as we turn to 3 John, I want to just make a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the Point Restaurant is open after the service tonight with barbecue pulled pork sandwiches and fries, Caesar salads. Uh, chicken fingers and fries and ice cream sundaes. And so make a note of that if you haven't eaten or you want to eat a little more after church. And by the way, if you have a guest or meet a guest, that's a great place to go and just fellowship after each evening service. Uh, our Thursday outreach, of course, is 9.30 and 6 o'clock. And then one more big push next Saturday morning as we go out, really following up on a lot of commitments. And uh, yesterday we had 53 cards turned in from people that said they were interested in coming and we'll be emailing them tomorrow and we'll get some more of these types of contacts. But uh, let me remind all of you to stop by the resource table uh, that's out in the lobbies and pick up uh, one of the tickets or some of the gospel tracks. And let's really do our best to commit one to really commit one person this week to be your guest. Uh, remember that there are family photo opportunities. There's games on the field for children. Just talk about it. Most of all, talk about coming in and hearing the program next Saturday evening or next Sunday morning uh, at 9 uh, or at 11 o'clock. And so uh, make a note of that and plan to participate. Well, we're going to read our text for tonight, which is 3 John, and we're going to begin in verse number 12. And uh, appreciate uh, your prayers. And uh, we're opening right now God's holy word. Amen? Amen. And I was, I was watching our teenagers, and I want to just say uh, that I was very proud of our teenagers at the conference. When, uh, and I don't say this to be disrespectful because some of the groups that came, they had probably some newer Christians, and there were some kids that would kind of get up in the middle of church like they were in a movie theater or something like that and go, go to the back and come back in and so forth. And I appreciate teenagers at Lancaster Baptist who know that when this book is open, unless we're just really sick, we're going to stay attentive to the preaching of the Word of God. And I want to commend our teenagers for that because uh, you had a great testimony. And uh, we're going to finish tonight this short book of 3 John. And uh, that would mean that over the last several months, we've preached 1st, uh, 2nd, and 3rd John. Of course, we have guest speakers and different alterations to the schedule. Uh, Lord willing, uh, two weeks from tonight, I'll begin a book study that I've wanted to completely uh, preach and teach through for most all of my ministry, and that will be the book of Romans. And one of the great studies of Scripture as we study the gospel, the, the ramifications and implications of the gospel, it's a very doctrinal, very exciting book. It's not going to be something we finish in a few weeks or even a few months, but it's going to be something that I believe really helps our church. And so we'll officially announce that next week, but please start praying. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your prayers uh, that I might have study time and prayer time and preparation time uh, to preach a book like the book of Romans requires uh, uh, much in the Word. And so uh, we're thankful for Sunday night and thankful for your attentiveness. And so let's read uh, verses 12 through 14. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you again for the activities of this past week and for the way you worked in hearts. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege we've had to worship you in singing and in uh, preaching of your word. 
We thank you for the opportunity to give, and we pray again that you'd bless the offering of this weekend. There may be some here tonight still to give an offering in one of the boxes or online. And Lord, help us to be faithful in our giving as we have many opportunities before us. But now, Lord, as we open your word, we need that anointing for this service that only you can give. And I pray that you would help me and that you would use me and that you would help each one here to listen and to apply the word. In a few moments, we'll observe your table and we'll remember you. And we want our hearts to be ready for that. And so use this message to prepare us, I pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Falls down before 
Well, we are in the midst of an academic season here in our schools. We have, of course, a preschool. We have Lancaster Baptist School and, of course, West Coast Baptist College. And each and every one of those have various times of evaluations, various times of uh, exams, final exams, oral examinations for the young men graduating from the college. And, and so there's a lot of studying. There's a lot of preparation. And uh, not only do the students have uh, this academic season, and uh, just really now a month before college dismisses for the summer, uh, but even the schools themselves have been reviewed and under review over the last several weeks. Last Sunday night, right after church, I shook hands for a little while, went straight up uh, to the administration building and met uh, with our administration and uh, several principals from uh, area high schools. And uh, those principals were here for two or three days evaluating uh, our school. And we had prepared uh, our uh, uh, self-study for them, several hundred pages, which took several months. And uh, it was really uh, as if we were being scored and we were being scored and interviewed and uh, thank the Lord for the excellent report uh, that Lancaster Baptist uh, received and another six years of accreditation with the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. And so congratulations to uh, Brother Ewing and Brother Lee and Miss Anderson and Mrs. Houck and all the teachers. In fact, let's, let's appreciate them for a job well done uh, in the academics uh, last week. This past Friday morning after I uh, preached to the teenagers, I went up to my office and I met with our uh, uh, prompter and helper from uh, the Transnational Association of Christian Schools and Colleges, who's here helping us prepare for the college accreditation. And I spent uh, about an hour with him and went over all that will take place a few weeks from now for the college uh, accreditation review with uh, six presidents and vice presidents of colleges coming to visit our campus. And uh, we talked about uh, preparing and having our board ready and some of what they can expect. And, and uh, he also met with Dr. Gatch, Dr. Rasmussen, Brother England, and Brother Choi and many others along the way, Brother Hobbs, uh, so that everyone's ready to meet their counterparts, uh, to give reports and to answer questions regarding the fitness of West Coast Baptist College as uh, we go through the process of uh, self-study and finish that up in these next few days. And one thing that I have noticed is that whether it's the uh, children in the elementary or the uh, teens in the high school or the students in the college, or even those of us who lead these academic institutions, everybody likes to get a good grade. Parents should be concerned as to whether the students are ready. And students should be concerned as to whether they're ready. I've been concerned in asking uh, our school principals and our college administration, are we ready in this area? Are we ready in this area? And uh, how, how are these forms? Are they presented in? And just about every day I've been getting various emails from various departments about things that we're checking off, things that we're preparing. Why? Because we want to get a good report card. Everybody likes to receive a good report card. Now in the book of 3 John, there are a few prominent names given, amongst whom are Diotrephes and a second man by the name of Demetrius. And what we have learned thus far in our study of this church, pastored by a man named Gaius, is that the man Diotrephes had not received a good report card. Diotrephes was a man because of his insecurity, perhaps, his desire for prominence, his desire, according to this word that we see in verse number 9, to have the preeminence, he did not receive a good report. In verse 9, uh, John the Apostle writes to the church and tells them that Diotrephes did not even receive himself as the apostle into the fellowship of the believers. And we saw that a week or two ago, how that this man literally prevented John the Apostle from having his apostolic influence there in the church. He did not want to have the influence of the Apostle. And with this in mind, it seemed that when John wrote this short letter, he wanted to make sure that the letter got to the church. Uh, Diotrephes had already done what he could to block the apostolic influence and to block the revelatory work of God. And so here John is going to make sure that the message gets to them by way of a man named Demetrius. 
Now, the first thing we learn about Demetrius is something that all of us should be curious about. And I want you to see it in verse 12 because the Word of God simply says, Demetrius hath a good report. Let's say that together. Demetrius hath. If you have a parent-teacher meeting with your teacher, it's a lovely thing when the teacher says, I have a good report for you. I have a good report about the behavior or the academics or the progress, whatever the case might be, everybody likes a good report. We do not know specifically about Demetrius' background or training or even his place in the church, but we do know that he had a good report. We do know that John felt his character to be trustworthy. I don't know about you, but I believe it's a wonderful thing when a seasoned man of God can speak of another man, maybe someone that's being mentored, maybe someone that's in a staff setting or serving somewhere, maybe a Bible college student, when a seasoned man of God can say, that's a good guy right there. And how many of you know there's a difference even between a good man and a godly man? It's even better when someone can say, he walks with God. He's a faithful man of God. Now, it has been conjectured that John thus commended Demetrius because he was the bearer of the letter. Several of the commentators said that Demetrius may very well have been the one to deliver the letter with his hand so that Diotrephes did not block the letter from getting in. Whether that is the case or not, Many felt that Demetrius would have been one of the traveling assistants of the Apostle John. John knew him well, and John describes him as a man of good report, a man with a good reputation, a man that could be trusted to come and to be with them. For these many years of pastoring this church, I have always endeavored when having someone to come and visit our church or to stand behind this pulpit to vet them, to know about them, to understand their doctrine and their character. And sometimes that involves asking someone like a Dr. Sisk maybe, uh, what do you know about this brother? And I always want to hear something like this. He has a good report. He is a good man. He is a man that walks in the Spirit and that preaches and rightly divides uh, the Word of God. Now tonight, every one of you men will either be a Diotrephes or a Demetrius. You will either receive a poor report or a good report. And by the way, every one of us will stand and give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us are building our reputation and legacy in the sense of whether or not we are faithful to the Lord, whether or not we are having a good testimony. And so tonight I want you to study with me a very brief message, but let's see the contrast and let's pray that God would help us to be a Demetrius in this hour. I want you to see first of all tonight the faithful messenger. The faithful messenger. In verse 11 the Bible says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but follow that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. This faithful messenger is going to be contrasted with an evildoer. We're going to see a contrast with an evildoer in reference tonight is this man, Diotrephes. John reminds the church that if one is practicing evil deeds, then he has not seen God. And the phrase not seen speaks of a perception or being acquainted by experience. And what the Apostle John is telling us in this verse is that someone who behaves the way Diotrephes behaved was a man who did not know by experience or understanding how to walk with God, nor did he walk with God. John was saying that this is a man that did not know God by experience. Now listen, you may know about God. You may even be born again through Jesus Christ and still not be acquainted with God and walking with God in the sense of holiness, in the sense of sincerity, in the sense of being a spirit-filled man. Diotrephes was a church man. He was a leader in the church, but he was not a man of God. And what we desperately need in this hour as Satan is unleashing every attack and every arrow that he can point at the church. We do not need men who shrink 
uh, at the cause of Christ, in the, when the battle is hot, we do not need men who are more familiar with sports box stories and sports stories and more familiar with the things of this world than they are with the things of God. What we need in this hour is not another Diotrephes. We need a Demetrius tonight. We need men who experientially walk with God. Not simply men who know where the book of Genesis is, though that's commendable. Not simply men who know uh, where their Sunday school class is, though that's wonderful. We need men tonight who walk with God. And the Apostle John is saying that that this man Diotrephes was an evildoer. He was someone that experientially was not walking with God. Now we have a Saturday morning men's prayer meeting at this church. And it's not something I harangue people about or often uh, mention. It's certainly not a requirement for godliness that you attend that meeting. But I want to say tonight, men, that you, if you would be a godly man, One that experientially knows God must have a prayer time and a prayer place and a communion with God. You must have time personally uh, in the Word of God. Diotrephes knew how to blow smoke. Diotrephes knew how to talk big. He would have patted everybody on the back. Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Hey, hey, oh, hey, how you doing? And he knew how to, uh, how to be with men, and he knew how to influence men, but he was not influenced by God himself. And the Bible is very clear about this in verse 11. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. And so the faithful messenger is contrasted with an evil doer. But notice, secondly, this faithful messenger is confirmed by everyone. Now, this is amazing to me in verse 12. Demetrius Demetrius hath good report, notice this, of all men... Now, how many of you would agree with me? That's an amazing statement. The Bible teaches that we're to do everything possible to live peaceably with all men. And here we find a man who had a good report. He had an affirming report with all men. Totally the opposite of Diotrephes. Diotrephes did not have a good report, especially of those without And yet this man, Demetrius, did. Proverbs 22 and verse 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Men, you ought to be concerned about your name. Your name at work. Do they laugh at your Christianity at work? Or do they respect you as a Christian at work? They don't have to agree with your doctrine. But they ought to know that you are a man of God. You ought to have a good report. You ought to be a man that has a good name. There ought to be a desire in your heart with your family, with your extended family, that they know that you're honest, that they know that you have integrity, that they know that you pay your bills, that they know that you're not blowing your stack and getting upset and cursing at home and putting on your suit and tie to come to church. There ought to be something about you that has a unibody construction, that your integrity is something that is seen uh, through and through. And we see with this man Demetrius that he had a good report with notice this, with all men, that is to say with the family, that is to say with your boss, that is to say with the co-workers. Listen, it's one thing uh, to have a good reputation with some of your co-workers, uh, but there ought to be a good reputation with your boss. There ought to be a good reputation with your neighbor. It ought to matter to you that you have a good name. Why? Because at some point you may want to lead some of them to Jesus Christ. I think about our athletics here on the campus, and I understand once in a while a coach getting after a referee, sometimes maybe a parent being disappointed, maybe maybe a passing comment. But listen, I've made it my habit not to ride, not to ride against these referees. Some of them make bad calls. Some of them aren't nice people. And I watch sometimes during a basketball tournament, we'll have guests come in and they'll scream and yell at the referee. Sometimes they'll say names. And I'm not, I'm not preaching that I'm the greatest Christian that ever lived. Far from it. But I can tell you in 37 years of athletics on this campus, I have never screamed or said a word or a bad name at a referee for one simple reason. Hi, I'm Pastor Chapel from Lancaster Baptist Church. And right there, 
my name, my reputation is going to keep that door open or it's going to close that door. It matters. It matters that we have a good name with all men. Let me further help you with this. Turn, if you would, to Philippians 4 and 5. Philippians 4 and 5. Let your moderation be known unto how many men? All men. Let's say it again. Let your why? Read the next, ver- next phrase. The Lord is at hand. Not only is the Lord's return at hand, the Lord is at hand. He is watching. Let your moderation be known unto all men. I think every week of my life I've got to talk to somebody and not, not necessarily always an easy talk. A lot of times I have to talk to people that have been wrong Either they don't know it or they know it and they're not easy to admit or repent of it. And so I've got to kind of come in and you're a good guy and I love you and I know you didn't mean it and da-da-da-da, but did you see this? And, and I just pray. I know where this is going already. I just pray that somewhere in the conversation there's some humility so that I can help the person because they're going to make this worse if they don't quickly say, you know, I blew that. You're right. Let's, let's, let's do what we need to do. Uh, there needs to be some moderation in those kinds of meetings. There needs to be some humility in those kinds of meetings. By the way, men, you need to pray that you're the kind of man that is easily entreated. That is to say, if a godly man comes to you and puts his arm around you, maybe a Sunday school teacher, and says, hey, can I just talk to you about something? I made note tonight of a dear man from our church who's missed now two or three Sunday nights. I'll be, I'll be talking to him this week. Why? It's my job. It's my job. I'm not a hireling. I'm a shepherd. You say, you're going to yell at him? No. He might be sick. He might have a job I don't know about. But I am not a good pastor if I can see someone less involved and not care. You do not want a pastor that doesn't care. You do not want a pastor who doesn't see those things. You want a pastor who cares for the flock, who cares for you. And if I go to that brother and I maybe say, say, hey, let's go over here to the Holy, over here to the uh, Great Awakening Cafe and just sit down and have some coffee. If I go to him and say, hey, John, I, I've missed you lately. I just, it seems like your countenance has dropped a bit. It seems like you're kind of sitting toward the back now. Back, way, way back there. Who's back there? I'll see who I can pick on tonight. <laughs> hey, I just, just want you to know I've been burdened for you. Do you know the right response of a man with a good name is this? Thank you, Pastor. And then the conversation can begin. Either it's a spiritual, a medical, a physical, a scheduling. I'm not, I'm not going to assume it's always a spiritual problem. It's just I want to know. I'm a pastor. I want to be a good shepherd. The Bible commands me to know the state of the flock. And when that happens, there should be a sweet spirit. An easily entreated man is a mature man, a secure man. Not someone whose nostrils flare. Not someone whose eyes get big. Not someone who's like going on here? Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. I'll tell you what you need to know. No, 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 no. Somebody that has a good name, somebody that has a moderate spirit is someone that has a good testimony. So all men, it ought to be in your church you have a good name. It ought to be at your job you have a good name. It ought to be in your neighborhood you have a good name. What would you do to keep that good name? What if you had a neighbor that you were crossways with and you got in the flesh with? Now, don't, come on, men, stay with me. Some of you look right up here. You don't need to study your iPad right now. Look right up here. What if you had a neighbor and maybe their kids bugged you and you yelled and screamed out at them and you got ticked off at them? And if, if you've done that, and I've done things like that, normally if you do something like that, the Holy Spirit immediately does what to you? He convicts you. Now, you have one or two choices there. Number one choice. The kid deserved it. They're the dumbest kids I've ever seen. I should have said more to them. 
My wife wouldn't have been there. I would have. And just say that you're in the right. Second choice, go find the kid. Go find his dad. Look his dad right in the eye and say, hey, Joe, how's it going? Boy, by the way, these seven cars in your lawn, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Normally, these are the kinds of neighbors you might struggle with several things. And you go say, hey, Joe, look at the kids were playing, ball came in, hit my car. It's happened before. I got mad at your kids. I let my temper flare. I just want to tell you something. I'm sorry. And uh, if you'd like me to say that to your son, I'll say it to your son. Now, why in the world would you humble yourself to some neighbor with seven cars in the lawn and bratty kids? Maybe because there is a hell? Somebody help me tonight. Maybe because having a good report is important? <laughs> Brother Beeson, <laughs> forgive me for using a personal illustration. Years ago, Brother Beeson, you've been here long enough, I'm, I'm quite confident I can use this. Remember you bought a new car and I said something about it? Do you remember that? I, am, I meant nothing by it. I was just extremely jealous that he had a new car. <laughs> I don't even remember what the car was. This might have been 20-some years ago. It, and I forget if it embarrassed Brother Beeson or if it just sounded wrong. I forget what it was. But I, I probably made a rookie mistake. I had a choice to make. I very easily could have said, that's Kurt's problem. Everybody knows he's just a baby Christian. I could have thrown it off on Kurt. I just went to Brother Beeson. I'm the pastor. I'm the overseer. He's the member. I just said, hey, Brother Kurt, I, I said something about your car the other night. I don't know if that settled well or felt good or if, how it came across. I forget what I said, but I essentially said, but I'm sorry about that. You know why? I wanted this man to hear the next sermon and the next sermon and this sermon. I'm trying to illustrate to you tonight that letting your moderation be known is not something that's a one-time, it's a lifetime thing. And we must walk in the Spirit, men, if we're going to get a good report. Every one of us should want a good report. You can get a good report through your conduct, 1 Timothy 3, 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. God says, I want the preachers to have a good report towards them that are without. It's important that we pay our bills on time. It's important that we have a good testimony with our neighbors. It's important that we have a good testimony with our city fathers. Uh, we want a good testimony towards those that are without. 2 Corinthians 8, 21, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. I've had people say to me sometimes, I don't care what men think about me. You should. Mostly we care about what the Lord thinks. But we should care that we have a good enough testimony in our neighborhood and at our work that we can witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Let your speech be always seasoned with grace seasoned and seasoned with salt that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. So, having said these things, come back to verse 12 and notice what it says. Demetrius hath good report of all men. Let's say that together. Demetrius hath good report of all men. How many of you are beginning to realize that's not going to happen by accident? We're going to have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We're going to have to be easily entreated. We're, we're going to have to be the types of people that... that Someone can come to. I, I, I think of Dr. Rasmussen here tonight. Dr. Rasmussen, how long have you been in Christian education? 40 years? 44 years. 44 years he's been teaching young people. Let's thank Brother Rasmussen for that. That's amazing. Not often. 
But once in a while, Brother Rasmussen will transgress in some area. There'll be some area, normally not intentionally, maybe something that he didn't quite see the same way. But there have been a few times I've had to say to Dr. Rasmussen, I need to talk to you. And I'll say, you know, the way this played out, I don't think that brought honor to the Lord. I don't think it helped our college, whatever the case might be. Very few times. But those few times that that has happened, I can tell you his response. Pastor, I am so sorry. It matters that you have those kinds of relationships that are right with one another. That you care that your report is good, not just with some men, but to the best of your ability, with all men. There may be someone even now that God is putting on your heart to whom you can speak, to whom you can encourage, to whom you can show a blessing toward them just to keep the testimony right. It's not always easy, men, to humble ourselves. It may be your wife tonight that is the one that you go to and you apologize for something. But Demetrius had a good report of all men. It matters. Notice, secondly, not only this faithful messenger, but also notice a truthful messenger. Now, verse 12, Demetrius hath a good report of all men. Now watch this. And of the truth itself. Now that's amazing to me. Not only did all the men in this environment of this man say, he's a good man, he's a godly man. Not only did the neighbor with the cars and the co-worker and the wife say, he's a good man, but the truth itself testified that he was a good man. Now that's amazing. Because it's one thing... And some men can do this. They can fool, lot, fool lots of other men, but you will never fool God. So let's dig into this for just a moment. Here we see that the behavior of Demetrius was confirmed by the truth. That's why devotions are important. That's why the psalmist said, search my heart, Lord, and try my heart, and show me if there be any wicked way in me. So that, because listen, uh, many times I've talked with men, and, and, and as the meeting goes, they're, they're just convinced that they're okay. This isn't my problem, it's the boss's problem. Not, not my problem, pastor, it's your problem. Not my problem, it's so-and-so's problem. And I'll tell you how to handle this. I'll tell you how to be a pastor. I'll tell you how to handle those accreditors. I'll tell you how to handle this. I'll tell you how to handle that. Da, da, da. And, and if you're not careful... You become your own standard of what a godly man is. Let me tell you something. I'm not the standard and you're not the standard. This book is the standard. And the great thing about Demetrius is that all men testified. And, but someone might say, well, maybe you could fool a lot of men. But the truth testified. Now, to live out a life that all men give good report to he had then to be a man who was walking in the truth. This means he applied the truth to his life. Every man here ought to come to church. Uh, whether you're a father, a single man, a college man, every one of us ought to come to every service saying, God, give me a truth that I can put into my life and live this week. I was telling a young man this week as it pertains to his spiritual growth, I said, something that helps me is when I have my devotions in the morning, I write down the dominant truth that God spoke to me about. He said he has trouble just reading and comprehending. And I said, well, I'll tell you something that helps me. When I read God's Word, I write down the dominant truth that God speaks to me about. And by the way, after all these years of reading the Bible, He zings me every morning with His Word. There's something every morning that I need personally in my life. I believe Demetrius had that spirit because the truth was witnessing to his testimony. He applied the truth. He also lived the truth. James 1, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Oh, we need men tonight who are living out the truth of the word of God. We're finding today that there's an, uh, an onslaught of Satan against Christianity, against the Bible, against all that is good and right in our nation. And many times men cannot speak the truth because you're not living the truth. You know the truth, but you can't say it at work because they'll say, well, why did you do that? 
Who are you to say that to me? You don't live it. A man of God living the word of God is a mighty weapon in the hand of God. So Demetrius not only has the witness of all those around him, but he has this confirmed by the truth. And then I want you to see a third witness. As if he is on trial. If you were on trial. Could you bring all parties of work, family, social life, church life? Could they testify? Could you open the scriptures? Could they testify? But now this man Demetrius has a third witness in verse 12. Notice it says, Demetrius hath the good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record. And ye know that our record is true. Now I don't know about you. If I was on trial, I wouldn't mind having the Apostle John come to the witness stand. A man so great a Christian, he was boiled to death in oil in a giant pot as a martyr for Jesus Christ. I would say a pretty sincere witness, a witness of the resurrected Christ. And this third affirmation of Demetrius, of Demetrius' good report was the Apostle John himself. And notice what he says here. He says, we bear record. He is laying his discernment on the line. I, I'll tell you something. Over the years, I've always been very slow to give a recommendation to a church for a pastor. I get asked, I think every day for a recommendation for churches. There's way more churches right now needing pastors than there are young men going out in the ministry. And I, our staff devised a system, and it's not bad. It's kind of an online thing, and you put up some guys' names, and people looking for pastors can go there. But I will tell you, that's not the way to find a pastor. <laughs> it's like finding your spouse in a dating app. I know some of you found your spouse that way, but you did more than just look at the picture online, I hope. I'm not going to recommend someone to be a pastor that doesn't have that good report, that doesn't have that good name. We just offered a position to a new member of our leadership team, and because of my love for this church, I, as always, did my best in digging and searching and making dozens of phone calls and studying in every ministry and trying my best to know. And why? Because it is important that we have men of good report on the staff of Lancaster Baptist Church. Now, here, John says, I will bear record of this one. So when John the Apostle bears record, that's an amazing thing. Now we have all men. Now we have the Bible. Now we have the apostle saying, he's, he's a good one. He's a good man. And so this Demetrius had a testimony that was pleasing to the Lord. Now John's discernment was known with much wisdom. He personally knew Jesus Christ on this earth. He heard his teachings, instructions, and warnings. He had years of wisdom. He was a witness of the resurrected Christ. And when someone like that says, this is a good man, then I believe we're beginning to see the caricature of a man who truly walked with God. Matthew 12 and 34 says, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. And so here we have a good man with a good report from all around and from the Word of God itself. We have a faithful messenger. We have a truthful messenger. Demetrius hath a good report. Now I'm not speaking any of this to make any man here tonight feel guilty. Guilty. You might say, wow, I blew it. Pastor probably knows I cussed out my neighbor last week. I know nothing like that. I don't have spy cameras on your house. Your wife didn't email me. Relax, men. All that that's been going through your mind tonight is from the Holy Spirit, my friend. But this is no game. How many of you know that we need a church full of Demetriuses tonight. And if you've got to make some things right with God tonight to be a Demetrius, then you do it. Because if you don't, it will reflect in your children. It will reflect in your family. It will reflect in your life. It will not reflect well to the Lord Jesus. 
every one of us should desire to have a good reputation for the Lord. We have a faithful messenger. We have a truthful messenger. Notice finally, we have a concluding message. Verse 13. Here again, John the Apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. I love that verse for a lot of reasons. Number one, I love ink and pen. I hate computers. I have computers. I use computers. I have a computer phone. I have a computer iPad. I have a computer computer. I, every sermon I do is on a computer. I get it. I do emails every day. I, I don't know how many emails I do every day. They're a necessity. But when I want to get alone with God and hear from God and make a record of what he's telling me, I love to take out a pen and a paper. There's just something for me about writing it out. I learn better when I write something with my hand. And uh, I enjoy an ink and a pen. Now, I don't know what kind of pen this was that John had, to be honest with you. It might, might have been some kind of a feather he dipped in, you know, a quill that he dipped into the ink. But he says here, he says, I, I, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. Here we see a concluded writing. There were many things John wanted to say, but the Spirit was leading him at this moment not to write those things. A fool uttereth how much of his mind? All of his mind. John was a spiritual man. Even in the writing of this book, the Spirit of God is drawing this to a conclusion. He's obeying the Spirit of God. And there is a desire, I believe, on the part of spiritual men as well. And that is to go face to face in speaking to someone. Friend, if there's ever a problem with you and someone at work, someone at church, someone in your family, may I highly recommend you not attempt to solve the problem with an email. You will exasperate the problem. Text and email is not how you solve a problem. It's how chickens attempt to solve a problem. Apparently what John had on his mind was something the Holy Spirit was restraining. If you're tracking with me, say amen. The Holy Spirit's winding this down. And John is saying, the things that I want to say, we'll just say face to face. And real men can have those kinds of talks. Spiritual men can have those kinds of talks. He said, I want to bring some things face to face. A text can sometimes be too much. Uh, 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 an email can sometimes come across caustic or negative or a reprimand that you didn't intend to be. And so we see a concluded writing, and then we see a comforting arrival, verse 14. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. By the way, if you're right with God, and if you have a good report with all men, you're not going to be afraid about a face-to-face -face meeting. You're going to be glad about a face-to-face -face meeting. Good. I get to talk to the apostle. We get to talk face-to-face -face about the work of the Lord. That is awesome. John I believe, is here comforting Pastor Gaius with the expectation that he would come soon and that there would be a personal visit from the apostle. May I say tonight, there is too much wasted time in Christendom using Twitter, Facebook, iPhones, which create negative feelings, discouragement, slander, and garbage on a daily basis. Amen. Say, well, you're a preacher. You have to say that. I don't have to say anything. I'm trying to help you. There are some of you here tonight, you spend so much time on Facebook, you are neglecting God's book. There are some of you tonight that need to spend more time face-to-face -face talking to your wife and less time on Facebook. Some of you need to go on a social media vacation. You're on it so much, you don't realize how much TikTok your teenagers are on. You don't realize that new hairstyle, that new dress style, those new words. They're not coming from you. They're coming from social media. And we are living in a day that is desperately in need of face-to-face -face relationships. You don't mind if I preach the Bible tonight. I just want to help your family. Those of you with children at home, this is not in the text. What's in the text is face-to-face. -face. 
But I might suggest that when you sit down for dinner, and I might suggest you do that a few nights a week, that you take every cell phone in that family and set it in a basket on another table. And that you talk face to face. It's important to see someone's eyes and what they're thinking. It's important to sense if they're feeling conviction or hurt or grief. It's important that you know their emotion and that you know how to speak maybe more firmly or less firmly to them. And John knew this. John knew that the letter was great. It was the word of God. But he said to Gaius, I'm looking forward to coming and, and seeing you face to face. Would you say that with me? Face, face to face. What a wonderful thought. I, I grow weary of little pipsqueak Christians that want to send me little messages. Little pipsqueak Christians sitting in their mother's basement eating Cheerios, writing critical messages. Once in a while, we'll have a Christian just kind of little, put a little smirk out there or something. I'll just say, I have a phone number. Call me. I'm not going to argue with some little pick squeak on social media. Somebody wants to see me face to face, I stand right out there after every single service. Come on up and say hi. Glad to talk. I don't know how many times a week I'm cursed at on the internet. Dozens and dozens. There's a lot of people who can't handle face-to-face. -face. But spiritual men like John and Gaius, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. And in fact, it's a blessing. There ought to be something in you that when you see another godly brother face-to-face, -face, it's just kind of nice to see him. Don't let social media replace good face-to-face -face fellowship in your life. Don't be a spiritual pipsqueak. In the Greek, pipsqueak means pipsqueak. <laughs> Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. We see a concluded writing, a comforting arrival, and finally a consoling conclusion. Notice in verse 14 what the Bible says. Peace be to thee. Let's say that together. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Here we see peace. By the way, true peace comes from the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And even though they had a nut job like Diotrephes in their church, he says, peace be with you. Because peace doesn't come from people. Peace comes from knowing Jesus Christ. True peace comes from the Lord and from his word. And the final greeting says, our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. You know, you have friends in the Orient tonight. And hundreds of them said, tell the people of Lancaster Baptist, thank you for sharing and for having a team to come and for having you come to preach to us. The friends greeted you. And it's a wonderful thing to be a part of the family of God and to have friends who know God and love Jesus Christ. Gaius had many friends in the circle of fellowship where John was at this time. And John had many friends in the circle of fellowship of Gaius. And so they are closing that circle uh, of outrageous behavior. And, and as they are uh, having friends greeting friends and as they are meeting face to face, guess who's going to be on the outs? Diotrephes. When godly men are loving and encouraging one another, and when godly men are meeting face to face, and when godly men are being godly men, Diotrephes can't feel comfortable with that. He's better with a real red hot email. He's better with blowing his temper. He's better at cursing someone out. He's better at blocking out John than he is at talking with John because he's a spiritual pipsqueak. He might seem big. He might seem bad. He might be able to talk a big talk, but he can't look the apostle face to face. But but when you love Jesus and you love the Bible and you're right with God, you're happy to sit down with God's man and have a little talk. Amen. And so Gaius and the Apostle John and their friends, 
they're starting to identify who are the men walking with God and what is the basis of our friendship. And it is his word. It is his resurrection. It is the faith. Tonight, we see a faithful messenger. His name is Demetrius, a truthful messenger. Not only did his friends testify, the word testified, the apostle testified, and we hear a concluding message that the friends look forward to seeing one another, not on social media, but face to face. Let me tell you something. Online, and there's some watching tonight, I'm glad you are. Online is one thing, face to face is another thing. I hope everybody watching online tonight is doing well, feeling well, loving the Lord. I'm glad they're watching. But there's something about face to face. There's something about seeing a man who's nodding while I'm preaching and seeing a man who's real still and seeing the man ducking behind the person in front of him and seeing the man constantly looking down, seeing the man looking up and seeing the man saying amen and seeing the man looking at his watch. There's something about face to face that's very important. Forsake not the what? Assembly. 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 I just believe there's something to be said about face-to-face -face assembly. And I think we all learned a lesson during this crazy COVID time that there were a lot of control freaks in the government and a lot of lying scientists exaggerating. I'm not saying COVID was not a medical problem. It was. But there was a lot of exaggeration for the purpose of control. And thank God that while we took a few weeks off, we just kind of got right back to studying the Word of God and obeying the Word of God regarding worship. Amen. And by the way, that ought to be the pattern until Jesus Christ comes again. Amen. Why? Because the devil knows that when Christians are face-to-face -face and this book is open, good stuff happens. Listen, I listen to, uh, you know, CDs and, you know, broadcasts, and I understand technology, and I'm thankful uh, for, for live stream. But I'm telling you tonight, there's something about the old-fashioned revival meeting where the evangelist is looking us straight in the eye. And so tonight, a faithful messenger, a truthful messenger and a face-to-face -face meeting to come. I want to ask you tonight, how's your report card? What would everyone say? Oh, that guy's approachable, so humble. Yeah, one time something didn't feel quite right, and he just said, hey, boy, I'm sorry if it came across that way. You couldn't have had an easier meeting, just face-to-face -face with him. Or, oh, 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 first you had to find him. Then when we found him, his nose flared. His eyes bulged. It was a really tough one. How's your reputation? What does it say about Demetrius? Pretty amazing statement made about this man. And I close with this. Demetrius hath a good report of all men. Let's say that together. Demetrius hath a good report of all men. Of all men. May it be true of each of us tonight that we have a good report with all men. Don't take the attitude. I don't care what he thinks about me. He deserves it. I'll treat him this way. No, no, no. God wants us to have a good report with all men. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for this time to study this book of 3 John, to contrast Diotrephes and Demetrius. Thank you for the good men at Lancaster Baptist Church men that are here on a Sunday night with their families, looking their preacher face to face, looking into the Word of God. But Lord, would you build us tonight into even stronger men? And if there's any man here tonight, there's just been a little something perhaps, in the, a little glitch in their spirit, would you show, that, show them what that is and help them, I pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Men, I've preached primarily to you. The piano's going to play right now. If God spoke to your heart before you put the cup to your lips, come tonight. Let me encourage you to come and pray. Repent of sin. I ask you tonight, men, is there a man in your street, at your work, in your church that would say, you know, he's an okay guy, but I ask you tonight, is there someone you need to apologize to? Is there someone in your dorm that would say, well, I mean, he's a pretty good guy, but I can't believe what I saw on his computer. 
good men. Demetrius was a good man. We need good men tonight. All of us that are standing in a moment will partake of the Lord's table. The Bible commands us prior to partaking to examine ourselves. And so let me encourage you in light of this message just to examine your heart and ask the Lord to show you anything he wants you to repent of. Father, I pray that you'd help each of us as dads and granddads to be men with a good report. Help the single men to have a good report. Help us to love seeing each other face to face. Help us to encourage one another. Help us to be easily entreated, not putting off like Diotrephes did, but receiving like Demetrius. Bless this next portion of our service, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we prepare for the Lord's table, and I'll ask the, uh, the uh, deacons if they would make their way to the front at this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As our deacons come, tonight we'll observe the Lord's table. While you're finding 1 Corinthians 11, I'll read for you 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 2, which says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth. This book that I'm reading to you in context was written to a local church at Corinth. This uh, ordinance that we're about to observe is a local church ordinance. That is to say that someone that just on their own with their friends in the desert, decides they're going to have communion. They're drinking juice, but they're not having communion or observing the Lord's table. The Lord's table was given as a local church ordinance and is to be observed in the churches as a way to remember the Lord Jesus. There are two ordinances, the Lord's table and, of course, baptism. And the word ordinance means a way of remembering. And tonight we're here as a church to remember the Lord. We have folks here tonight that may be guests from other churches. We're glad you're here. Uh, we do not practice in our church open communion for the simple re two simple reasons. One, some people that are from a different tradition, such as Catholicism, they might think that by taking that juice, they're continuing their works quest for salvation, and we don't want to be a part of that false journey. And secondly, uh, I do not know the people that are here. And as the under-shepherd of this church, to the best of my knowledge, I've preached this message to you. I see you face to face. And your testimony by taking this tonight is that you're right with the Lord. And as a body, uh, we're coming together in good faith to observe the Lord's table. But someone who's visiting tonight, uh, I may or may not know their spiritual condition. And whether this makes sense or not to some, it, it, it's, it's uh, uh, not the main issue. But I want you to know I do not want to usurp authority over another pastor's flock. And I feel like administering the Lord's table is the job of the local pastor. And so God didn't put me in charge of every, every church out there. He didn't, he didn't tell me to oversee every church, but he did place me here as an overseer. And so if you're a guest tonight, please don't be offended, uh, but we believe this is a local church ordinance. I wanted every young man in the balcony to hear that. I believe what I practice at this church uh, is helpful to the uh, doctrinal unity and spiritual unity of the church. And many of you that are not members here, 
Uh, I want you to prayerfully watch as we partake and remember what Jesus did for you. But when you get home to your home church, you can partake of the Lord's table with your pastor. doesn't mean we don't love you. It just means if you haven't joined here, uh, we're not responsible in my conviction to administer this Lord's table because it is written to the local church at Corinth. Now with that context in mind, the Apostle Paul says in verse 23 of chapter 11, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. By the way, to be worthy in this sense is to be saved and to know that you have a right standing before God. Then, verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And we've emphasized that in our message tonight. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. There may be a case where someone is saved, but they're living in sin, they're living away from the Lord, and to just drink and to act like everything's fine is to bring harm to yourself. So every Christian, every Christian should be very sober-minded as we approach the Lord's table. And and uh, should recognize this is not a game. This is what God is saying. He's saying, examine yourself. He's saying, some people are sickly among you. Some sleep. That doesn't mean they're on sleeping medication. It means they died. Not everyone. Not everyone uh, should, that's sick should be thought of as having not been right with God. But there were some that just were making a joke of the Lord's table. And, and it became a, a matter of chastisement and a, and a deep matter of, of discipline in their life. Verse 31 for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. And what I have just described to you is what we might call Baptist polity, explaining to you that this is a local church ordinance, explaining why we partake of it, to remember the Lord, how we partake of it. We partake of it as members of the church, and we partake of this as a people worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And so having said these things, let us pray, and our deacons will serve the bread to those uh, who are a part of this church family. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for your great love to us, displayed on the cross of Calvary. Lord Jesus, this morning we were reminded of what a crucifixion is and how your body was broken and your blood was shed. And tonight we are following that ordinance that you gave to the church and that you desired us to remember you by. Some may have crackers or bread. Tonight we have these little wafers. But Lord, we pray that as we partake of this, that our hearts would be filled with gratitude and worship for what you did on Calvary for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And ask Brother Tim McDonald to thank God for the bread and ask his blessing upon the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to share with you and to remember the great sacrifice you have made for us. Lord, we ask that you would then continue to bless tonight as we now take the juice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.
After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Brother Mike Averbeck to thank God for the cup and ask his blessings upon our church. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to remember what your son did on the cross for us. We thank you for the shedding of the blood and what it means for us and the power of salvation that it brings. Mm -hmm. Pray, Lord, that you would bless the rest of the service. Thank you for all that you've done. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together tonight as we sing, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Join with me as we sing it. Here comes Brother Williams. Brother Williams, come lead us. Blessed be the tie that binds. Bible college students. I don't normally address them individually, but I want some of you young preachers to hear me tonight. That song we just sang, you know why we sang it? Because I sang it when I was a little boy in church. And that's the power of the hymnal and the power of hymns. I love the newer songs. There's a place for them. The Bible tells us to sing a new song. But songs like this can tie generations together grandchildren with their grandparents and so forth. So there ought to be some things. You don't have to copy everything from here, everything from your home church, but there ought to be some things that you say, that helped me get to where I'm at, so I'm going to use it to help the next generation get to where they need to go. And this song actually helped me. It helped me as a little child understand what a church is. It's a, it's, it's a group of people that have a tie in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit ties us together. And so I love this song, as you can tell. I hope some of you guys are singing it 20 and 30 and 40 years from now, and uh, maybe you just learned it here. That's good. That's why you came to West Coast Baptist College, because you were ignorant before you came here. You never heard that song before you came here. So I don't know if you've heard it or not, but uh, there's a little extra education for you. So I'm going to lead it this time. Let's sing it together on the first. Blessed be the tie that binds. Lift up the volume just a little bit now. Blessed be the tie that spirit of every Christian. I, I can't wait to get back to church. I can't wait to meet again with these people, the, the redeemed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, folks, it's been a wonderful day. I love you. I love being your pastor. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night, and I look forward to a great resurrection Sunday together. Be sure to clear that table out with invitations and jelly beans. Put your pockets full uh, of these things and pass them out this week, and let's look for souls to be saved next Sunday. It's been a wonderful day. I think we've covered all the announcements. Don't forget the point is open. God bless you. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.